Sound Productions presents Brass, the audio series. Episode 38, Missions and Statements. The year is 1886, and it is just now dawn on this grey March morning, which lingers on the threshold of spring. Twelve miles outside Paris, along a dirt road made muddy by recent showers, a small motor carriage of elegant design but rattling frame arrives at the private airfield of the eccentric English aristocrat Lord Whitestone, also known as Tucknor, King of the Ape People. With a final juttering shutter and cloud of grey smoke, the vehicle comes to a stop. My insides. Now, I'm rather glad we skipped breakfast. This Zephyr Courier was a fairly rough ride yeah. and a bit of a handful to steer, if I'm to be honest. Oh, I shan't be renewing my lease upon it. <laughs> what does it run on? A petroleum derivative called gasoline, <laughs> believe it or not. Is that what causes the smell and the smoke? I expect so. Why on earth would anyone invent such a thing? To see if it works. Benjamin, I've ridden in carriages powered by steam, electricity, and ethereal batteries. None of them smelled or smoked. Steam carriages do occasionally blow up. Do these gasoline vehicles do that? Occasionally. Then again, why? Well, the fuel is cheap. If this is the price we are expected to pay for progress, then God help us. Lord Brass, Abbot, so good to see you both. How was your journey? Longer than desired. And many miles before us, alas. But we had to come by and see you and the rest of the squadron off. I am so glad you have. This is so exciting. <laughs> I have read much of war and want to participate in such a glorious event. Have you ever been to war, Lord Whitestone? Not with men, though I did oversee the conquest of a territory of neighboring gorillas with my tribe of intelligent apes. Nature red in tooth and claw, eh? Mm. I would suspect that the way men make war is much more horrible than anything the animals can do. Let us hope ours is swift and a triumph of our intellect, not a disgrace to our natures. Ah, Mr. Grassley. Lords. Mr. Qatar, the squadron is assembled. Capital. Let's saunder over that way, shall we? I'd like to say a few words to the company, if you don't mind, Mr. Grassley. Of course. I've cabled Lady Grass to expect your arrival in 14 hours. Does that still correspond with your timetable? It does with mine. Dr. Jones insists that we'll be there in less time than that. I believe we will be there in 12 hours. The Aberdeen leg of the journey is, of course, the longer one. But thanks to the batteries, we should be able to remain airborne for at least 15 hours. Still cutting it closer than I'd like. 12 hours. It will be dusk or early evening when you reach Cove Bay. Yes, which should cut down on the likelihood of being spotted. It's prudent to hug the coast when we can, so we'll do so from north of Dundee on. Let's hope the weather cooperates. It would be ungentle indeed of Scotland to grant us anything short of my beloved Caledonia Grey prior to spring. Ah, here we are. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I won't make a long speech, as we've each got lengthy journeys ahead of us. And as I told a friend recently, one must be distrustful of one's tendency towards eloquence. But I want to say something before sending you off on your own mission. Led by your squadron leaders, Mr. Grassley and Lord Whitestone, aviators of great skill, and each a commander I would follow into battle as you shall. So, this is the beginning of what we hope is the liberation of a country and the restoration of men of moral character to its governance. One cannot help to stop and think of the bard at moments like this. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. Well, young Harry's few on the fields of Agincourt, which you'll be flying over in an hour, sir, were a damn sight more than our few. The campaign we are embarking on is audacious <laughs> and expensive. Every resource we have has been brought to bear. Still, I think this will work. It's all very elaborate, let me tell you that, but 
If we all execute our roles properly, it shall go like a glorious pocket watch and we shall have retaken a nation with scarcely a shot fired and a minimum loss of life. There's little margin for error, but we cannot let a fear of failure make us less than our best. We must trust each other, give to each other, sacrifice if need be for each other. When I look upon you, I see faces different than my own. I see women and faces brown and black. I see not just English, but brave French patriots, Arabian revolutionaries and Belgian spies. Since I have traveled the far reaches of this empire, I can tell you this. More of its people look like you than me. It is for them, as well as my beloved countrymen, under the malevolent rule of this cabal, that we take up this cause. A cause that is just, a cause that is right, and God willing, a cause that will prevail. Godspeed, my good friends. If all goes well, I'll see you in London. Mechanics? I want your final reports. This way, please. Not too much eloquence, I hope. A little flowery here and there, but not bad. Mm. You even kept your Shakespeare quotation to one line. It wasn't easy. It never is with Shakespeare. Indeed. Shall I recite to you the whole of the Agincourt speech? Do I have a choice? Not unless you want to walk all the way to Calais. What most people don't realize is that the speech actually begins with what's he that wishes so, my cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin, if we are marked to die, we are a no! Mm, yes, yes. It is afternoon in the London offices of the Daily Electrograph, and there is the humming buzz that comes from a day filled with news. In her office, Sitting in the centre of the storm is the paper's managing editor, the redoubtable Lady Florence Dixie, traveller, writer and war correspondent. Yet even battlefield reporting was generally less harrowing than the task of placing too much news into the finite pages of her afternoon paper. Aye, what do you want? Speak up, I've no time to waste. That's you, Ridley. Are the press at running? No. What are you waiting for? Sweet Gloriana, man, we're moving from an afternoon into an evening edition. What is it, Stanley? Uh, those three men were rather insistent that they see you. Gentlemen, no time for a social visit. Neither do we, Lady Dixie. This is a matter of national concern. But I suppose a man who arrives with not one, but two clergy and toe deserves my attention. Excellent. We need you to print a statement in your afternoon paper. Sorry, but I've just given a call to start the presses. But then stop them. Isn't that something you can do? Yell out, stop the presses! Young Martin, my newspaper has a credo. The largest, best and cheapest newspaper in the London metropolitan area. Now what assists in its costs being so low is that I do not often, if ever, yell out, stop the presses. I'll do it if you'd like. What would you have me stop my presses for? Here it is. It is a note of condemnation of the current government from His Excellency Pope Leo XIII and for good and righteous men to resist its immoral and unchristian practices, including the Seditious Aliens Act, the imprisonment of its critics, and the persecution of Catholics, Jews, Muslims, and others. I see. And I know whose authority am I to accept this as genuine? My own. I am a Jesuit priest. And I do not lie. He doesn't. Well, I'm sorry. This notification is printed on Vera Bunny paper. And this seal certainly does look impressive. But I am not going to stop the presses of this paper to include any such notification without thorough journalistic investigation. I see. Aye. If you could leave a copy of this here, I'll have my religious affairs editor give it the ones over this afternoon. And then you'll print it. After verification from the Vatican? Aye. Now, if you have anything else? Uh, yes, rather. And what's that? Uh, uh, a message from the Archbishop of Canterbury regarding the current government. I see. Well, again. If you can properly verify. Aye. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. Oh, no? No. I am the Archbishop of Canterbury. You are not. I am. I have these rings. Oh, my lord. You are the Archbishop 
He is. I met you at Wellington College a decade ago. You're Edward White Benson. I am indeed. And now, the Archbishop. Stop the presses! Do you have time for a brief interview, Archbishop? Sadly, he does not. We've still got to make the rounds of the rest of Fleet Street. This isn't an exclusive. Well, if you are also to print the paper letter, we could give you a half hour's head start from the rest of the pack. It's a deal. Gentlemen, your documents. Later that evening, Von Hoffman, the man also known as the Crime Minister, is sitting in his home study, speaking to his lieutenant on his Tesla device. Report, O'Leary. The company major says he's got a solid lead on our missing royals, apparently involved in some sort of mysterious velodrome up near Aberdeen. A velodrome? For bicycles. I know what it is, but why is there one in Aberdeen? Some eccentric Scottish lard had it built, apparently. Anomalies file? Perhaps. We'll see how it develops. We're sending a company to the area and patrols out starting tomorrow morning. Anything else? Not to concern you, sir. Do not keep data from me, O'Leary. Well, there's a report that there was a break-in at the Red Widow's old headquarters. Her lair? Yes, sir. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I ordered the retrieval of all relevant items from there upon her arrest. That was under the regime of my predecessor, so I can't say. Any sign of what they may have been after? It's been hard getting volunteers to check what with the fire pit, razor pendulum and drowning booths leading to her offices all still operational. Ah, the widow did love her death traps, God love her. She is missed. Well, put a patrol together of some men, make sure at least one of them is smart and the rest dumb enough to follow his orders. Does this go with the anomalies file? For further review, I think, yes. Anything else? Perhaps. Uh, Lord Trent. Uh, uh, is there still a problem there? Well, no, uh, but perhaps you overdid it a bit, sir. Trent's been as jumpy as a flea since his session with you. But more tractable. If you mean more likely to do what he's told when he's told, yes. Fear is far and away the most economic of motivators. Pain, anger, greed all have their place, but must be reapplied with an increasing force. Frighten a man sufficiently and you've made him your slave. Which reminds me, have you passed him along the agenda for tomorrow? I have, sir. No complaints? Well, he started to tremble a bit. But no complaints, no. Excellent. Might I ask what was in it, sir? Oh, (laughs) I'm so sorry I didn't include you in the news, did I? Well, it's an order to the Air Marshal of the Royal Air Corps. Oh, I see. He is to prepare the fleet for a sortie tomorrow afternoon. A sortie? An outing, a mission, call it what you will. We have discovered the den of a group of radical anarchists... Without prompt and decisive action, this is a cancer that shall grow past paring of the surgeon's knife. You mean the triangulation worked? It did. I've discovered where Brass's transmissions were coming from. Where is their base? Oh, somewhere in or around Paris. The readings are accurate within ten miles or so. Oh, so where will we be targeting? O'Leary... This transgression must be met forcefully, with the full and righteous wrath of our empire's might. We need to make a statement. We're going to level Paris. Level Paris? Use aerial bombardment to destroy the capital of the Belle Epoque, all in an effort to kill one man? What sort of deranged strategy is being proposed here, and who shall suffer? And what of the journeys that our heroes are prepared to undergo? And what is their purpose? To find out the answers to a good number of these questions, join us soon for the penultimate episode of Season 4 of Brass. Brass is manufactured by Battleground Productions and features Kate Cray as Lady Brass, Charles Leggett as Lord Brass, Catherine Grant Sutty as Gwendolyn Brass, and Jeremy Adams as Cyril Brass, with Larry Albert, Dennis Bateman, Margie Bickman, Lisa Carswell, 
Amy Decker, Nancy Fry, Ronnie Hill, Philip Keeman, John Longenbaugh, Matt Middleton, Terry Edward Moore, Tad Morgan, Pam Nolte, and Nikki Vissel. Brass was recorded at Jack Straw Studios, engineered by Joel Maddox, with sound design by Kirsty Gilmore, and music composed by Bruce Monroe. It was written and directed by John Longenbaugh. For more information on Brass, go to battlegroundproductions.org. Find us on Facebook and Instagram, and to support us, fund us on Patreon and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you.